Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining today. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this PQI innovation webinar titled A Narrative Review of the Role of PQCs in Promoting Birth Racial Equity. My name is Kaylee Vitek, and I will be operating the Zoom logistics of this webinar and introducing today's speakers. When I'm not providing tech support for PQI, I'm a project manager for the Massachusetts State Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Today, we are so excited to hear about the work published by four distinguished authors. Dr. Audra Meadows, who is the founding director of the State Perinatal Quality Collaborative in Massachusetts. Renee Byfield, who is the program director of the Speak Up Implicit and Explicit Racial Bias Education for PQI. Dr. Hafsatu Jop, the inaugural Assistant Commissioner of Health Equity at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and Dr. Deborah Bingham, who is the founder and CEO of PQI. Dr. Bingham will speak to some PQI introductory slides and then we'll turn it over to lead author Dr. Audra Meadows for today's presentation. A couple of housekeeping items before I introduce Dr. Meadows further. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted for free on the PQI website. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please type any questions you may have into the chat and we will address them. If you experience any technical issues, please feel free to send me a private message. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Audra R. Meadows, MD, MPH, FACOG. Dr. Meadows is a birth optimizer, a practicing OBGYN, health disparities researcher, and health equity champion. As I said before, she is the founding director of the State Perinatal Quality Collaborative in Massachusetts called PINQUIN, which is the Perinatal Neonatal Quality Improvement Network. She currently leads the Massachusetts Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health Initiative and the PINQUIN Maternal Equity Bundle. She is also a professor and vice chair for culture and justice in the Department of OBGYN and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Deborah Bingham, Bingham, who is the founder and CEO of the Institute for Perinatal Quality Improvement. Thank you all for listening and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Welcome everyone. It's so great to be here with my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Meadows and all of you, many of whom I do know personally. So it's so great to have you all here today. I'm gonna to give a quick update on some of the cool things that PQI is doing. Just as a reminder, uh, the, the mission, everything we do at PQI is mission driven and the mission we are working it towards is to expand the use of improvement science and in order to eliminate preventable perinatal morbidity and mortality and end perinatal racial disparities. We have several key initiatives that we are doing to help uh, change these horrible statistics. In the US, our um, maternal infant mortality rates are way too high when we compare to other countries, as many of you well know. And our um, pregnancy-related mortality ratios are way too high. And there's also huge disparities between our outcomes. And we've seen rises in a uh, significant rise in peri uh, maternal morbidity. So there's a lot of work to be done. We have not reached our goal. <laughs> we have not met our mission, so we have a lot of work to do. We, uh, as part of this work, we are also um, leading some efforts around Speak Up, um, which is uh, very important work. And one of the things that I realized as I was working on my dissertation and as, as we think about this, this reality is that conversation is where change begins. We each have the power to change the conversation. Too often we feel like this is too big of a problem. We can't make a difference. But if we change what we say and how we say it and who we speak to and we speak our truth, that does bring about change. And the journey, it's a journey. It's not a, a sprint. It's work that is uh, long, enduring and needs a lot of effort. And that's where we develop the Speak Up program. And we, we, our vision is that all perinatal health professionals will become Speak Up champions. And I know there are many champions on the call today. And we have a long-term goal and it's by 
2035 that Speak Up Champions will eliminate perinatal uh, disparities in their organizations and communities throughout the United States. We want to end all birth inequities. Um, and we have the Speak Up acronym that many of you are familiar with. Um, if you're not, please go to our website and look this up. It goes through very practical things that each one of us can do to eliminate perinatal inequities. Um, we have a learning pathway, an action and learning pathway. Champions then go on to become ambassadors. We're, uh, uh, that's the next level up. And some of the ambassadors will then apply to become faculty. And our faculty application is open for our next cohort. So please feel free to apply. Uh, <clears throat> and we have nearly 2,000 Speak Up champions. So we'd love to have you join us in this work. Um, our next Speak Up Champion course, uh, this is a national course, is on February 16th, 2024 in Galveston, Texas. Those of you in the Northeast, like myself, uh, feel free to come down and get a little warmer weather. Um, any of you near Galveston, please come on over. We'd love to see you come down over wherever you're coming from. We also then have a, our next ambassador course is on May 17th. So hopefully uh, you first need to complete the champion course before you can attend the ambassador course. So uh, love to have you join us in February so that you can be ready for the May 17th ambassador course. We also have online modules, uh, why everyone must speak up, pledging to speak up and how to speak up against racism. We would love to, um, yeah, have, uh, there's uh, both uh, non-CNE and CNE versions. The non-CNE is very affordable. We have, yay, starting tomorrow. And so if you have not signed up for our 28 day anti-racism challenge, please do so today. Kaylee just put it in the chat. You'll just take a second to sign up. <clears throat> uh, the emails will start day zero is tomorrow. Uh, by signing up, you will get in, in your inbox uh, reminders with links and it makes it very easy to be a part of this challenge. So there's, uh, an, we, have, we can accept any, any number of people can sign up. There's no limit to who can sign up. Many hospitals are, um, are um, doing this work as a team. So feel free to um, have your whole team participate. You can share with each other. The other thing we have happening is very exciting is we're launching the birth equity modules and uh, Dr. Meadows is one of our co-authors of this module and it will be released in April. <clears throat> and if you would like to enter the lottery on or before uh, uh, March 30th for a chance to win free access to this new course. Um, we would love to have uh, people that that is open and you can start to um, sign up for uh, being part of the lottery. Another thing we've been working on, and we're very excited, we're going to be giving a presentation on this at the National A1 Convention. It's on uh, expanding uh, freedom of movement through the safe use of intermittent auscultation. We have this simulation based module that helps educate people on the safe use of intermittent auscultation. And so uh, we're excited to be, um, to be able to uh, have this module and to be able to talk about it as well. And what we've learned during um, uh, several years now, we have thousands of people who have completed the module. It's very exciting. Um, and this uh, only shows the number of learners since November. 30th. So if you haven't, uh, the, so this is something we're working on because we know that there's overuse of C-section and that is a leading cause of uh, preventable morbidity and mortality. Um, so we also have our next uh, innovation webinar will be presented by uh, Emma Trunks, Christina Salfi, and Dak Ojuka. Um, they help lead uh, a statewide learning collaborative to improve severe hypertension recognition and response. And you can register for this webinar um, as well. 
So we hope you join us as either a free or um, as, a, as a paid PQI supporter of our efforts um, and um, keep up to date on all the things we're doing. Uh, we're very excited also. Our newest PQI profile is um, uh, based on a work that was done at Albany Medical Center and they highlight how they use the 28 day challenge as a team and then also how they um, are working with using Speak Up to help guide their equity work at their hospitals. So if you haven't read Kelly's uh, um, uh, you know, PQI profile about their work at um, Albany Medical Center, be sure to check it out. If you're doing cool and innovative things, please email us at info at perinatalqi.org. We'd love to profile you. Um, and so just a reminder, QI saves lives. We'd love to have, you know, if you uh, have any questions, suggestions, please be in touch with us. And I am now very excited to turn it over to my dear, dear colleague, um, Audra Meadows. So um, thank you so ahead. much. I'm really excited to be here with so many of you and really thrilled to be able to discuss the, the publication that we were invited to submit um, to the Obstetrics and Gynecology Journal, also known affectionately as the Green Journal. Uh, and what they'd asked us to talk about was the role of perinatal quality collaboratives in promoting maternal health equity and racial equity. And though, if we go to the next slide, though you're hearing me give this talk, Actually, this is the work of a few authors, one in particular, Dr. Bingham, who you just heard speak, uh, as well as Drs. Jopp, um, uh, Dr. Byfield, and then myself. And we were really happy that this was published in this particular version of the journal because this was a special issue um, on racism in reproductive medicine. And so this particular journal article or this journal edition contains a number of articles that looks at the challenges that we've been having, <clears throat> particularly around racial equity. Uh, in the field of reproductive health. Next slide. So I wanna say thank you and acknowledge to those, the authors. Uh, my only disclosure is that I'm also a faculty of PQI Speak Up program. It's, it's infectious, it's hard not to, to go forward into the other courses from champion to ambassador to faculty. Um, you can go to the next slide, Kaylee. Uh, it's, it's important that <clears throat> once we've started the pathway of speaking up, that we continue on to help spread that message in ways that we can create a culture of equity. And so a lot of what we talk about in our article and what I'll talk about today is how it is that we wanna to begin to create a culture of equity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about why the birth equity efforts are needed in the United States. I think many on the call are probably well aware of that. Um, I also wanna describe the role of perinatal quality to promote maternal equity. I think there's something I'm gonna say in, in this. And if you haven't read the article that you're gonna be really pleasantly surprised by. I also want to explore some of the tools to achieve birth equity, highlighting one specific tool, and that is the importance of data disaggregation to, to drive equity action. Um, and then we'll also outline our findings um, of this, uh, this article that was published in this issue. <clears throat> Excuse me again. And that is uh, the goal of how do we pave the way toward health equity. And so um, I'm hoping that something you'll learn today will help you feel like you can do that in your own institution. Next slide. First, I want to start with the goal. Maternal health equity is foundational to maternal health quality. And what we want to do is imagine our healthcare system that provides quality care, reports outcomes that are equitable, and reports optimal experiences, not just for the populations who generally have better outcomes, but for all populations. If we start there and end there, <clears throat> then I think there are things that we can together learn on how we can move our health system forward, our health systems forward toward that goal. Next slide. There are three important facts. One is, is that the United States spends more money than any other similar sized country on healthcare. We know that maternal morbidity and mortality rates in the United States are rising and higher than most similar countries. And, and the rates in other countries, as we've heard, are nowhere falling. And we now also have seen and heard many of us that a study that was published from the 36 state maternal mortality review committees reported that 84% of these deaths are preventable with the leading cause of death being that related to maternal mental health and 100% of those deaths were deemed to be preventable. These statistics tell us a story 
of the many challenges that we face to improve maternal health, though it is also our opportunity to move in the direction of improvement. I'm going to go to the next slide. So let's share with some national trends, um, many of these that, that I think many of you have seen, um, but they continue to remain shocking and persistent. And actually, interestingly, I feel like the more I've seen them and the more we keep showing these slides and the more we keep discussing these statistics, I, I don't want it to lose its shock value. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll show you another comparison in just a moment if you haven't seen this other comparison to see if that helps continue to elevate exactly what an issue we have here and why this is a call to action to address these trends. Next slide. So first, we know that the rates have risen. These are the rates and statistics. So that top number you see, the 754, that is the total number of deaths. The rate, that being per 100,000 live births, it was 20.1. That was what was reported for 2019 by the CDC. We've continued to increase and now we see 1,205 deaths in 2021 at a rate of 32.9. So we know that these rates are rising consecutively. The rising trend has preceded um, the COVID-19 pandemic, but only was worsened due to COVID-19 associated mortality for those who were pregnant and giving birth. Uh, and again, the majority being preventable. Next slide. This just shows the rate for non-Hispanic white and gray, Hispanic and yellow, and non-Hispanic black and the turquoise blue. And you see what percentage of the pie that that is for each of the groups. And it shows that there's a disparity. So we've heard that if you're Black or Native American in the US, you fare worse. But when you go to the next slide, you'll also see just how much more those numbers have gone up in 2022. So we know that we have rising rates. We have stark and persistent disparities. And when we talk about these disparities, we often talk mostly about the disparity between Black and all others are black and white. When you go to the next slide, <clears throat> and we think about what are the reasons for this? Why do we see this happening? And oftentimes the individual is blamed. But when you think among the population characteristics and demographics, the, the widest gap is between those who are black and other racial groups. But we could also be talking about demographics and outcomes by language, ethnicity, geography, because we also know that those who live in rural spaces also have higher rates of mater higher rates of maternal morbidity <clears throat> and likely maternal mortality as well. These differences that we see by race ethnicity, they are not due to biology. We do know that race is a socially derived concept. It's not biologically based. And because of that, we know that it's not the biology. <clears throat> We've even seen that black and native people or women experience uh, rates of morbidity and mortality that are um, high regardless of their income and we also have seen in data and gotten reports particularly through nursing literature on the negative experiences and the reports of bias that others experience that can explain some of these differences another really important concept though is that <clears throat> these issues are not specific to individuals these issues are specific to systems and so the goal is that we address this health system issue with health system solutions next slide and I want to really underscore that point by showing you an international comparison. Um, I'm going to see if we can uh, use the reaction key and get a sense of just how many people have seen the international comparisons. If you want to put a thumbs up to say that you've shown, you've seen the international comparisons. Great, I see some thumbs going up. Yeah, well, let's look at these international comparisons. If you go to the next slide. Of course, these, this is older data, 1990 to 2015, and something that is not surprising. The United States has not only higher rates, we've already said that, the rates in the US are continuing to rise while other countries' rates are going down and the reports of maternal death. But let's go to the next slide and let's do a US comparative comparison in the context of similar sized countries or countries giving birth to about the same numbers. And this information comes from Dr. DeClerc's Birth by the Numbers. Um, Dr. DeClerc is a um, biostatistician who's published and reported often and much on the outcomes related to maternal health. And what we see, if you look at the first column, 1901 to 1910, and move all the way over to the more recent years, 2017 to 2019, we see the numbers have gone down for everyone overall. But if you look all the way down to the bottom, the United States continues to rank the worst among these countries. And 
even though I've said, and, and we've often heard the concept that you know race is a social construct, but we know in the United States that African-American women have worse outcomes, or Black women, I should say, you wonder sometimes if that's related to the fact that in the U.S. we have a particular demographic. I've heard that question from students, and that's not actually it. If you look at the next slide, I'm going to show you the same data, but in a different um, format. I'm going to go to the next slide. And in this format, you'll see that at the bottom, the United States, 20.1. So this is not these rates are going to be a little bit different from the numbers I showed from the CDC because this is just in comparison of these three-year averages. When you go to the next, um, go to the next click, Kaylee, for me, and what you'll see is U.S. white is also much higher and greater. And when you pause on this and you think about the poor U.S. performance, it's not due to the size of our racial pro, um, populations with worse outcomes. There are systems factors underlying the poor U.S. performance. And how do we know this? One of the reasons is, is people who are pregnant, who identify as white in the United States, have mortality rates six times that of those in Germany, a country that one would argue has a smaller black population. And when you see that, you realize this is not about an individual because what is the difference of standing on the soil in the United States versus being white and standing on the soil in Germany and having a better chance of a, of a greater birth outcome, a better birth outcome. So it's six times more likely to be deadly to be pregnant in the US than in Germany. That's not an individual issue, that is a systems issue. And so that's why we lean into what is it that perinatal quality collaboratives can do to adjust and affect systems so that we can improve these outcomes for everyone. All right, let's go to the next slide. Again, as we know, the CDC has reported, um, and so if you haven't seen this publication from Susanna Trost and others, this was the publication that came out that showed the 84% preventability. Um, in this actual publication, you also see a breakdown of the different causes of maternal mortality by race. Um, you can also see where um, maternal mortality related to mental health disorders has reached the top and has been deemed number one. We'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> And here are those percentages. Mental health with suicide and overdose was 22.7% or rounded up to 23%. Um, so with maternal deaths being largely preventable, and we know that this is a systems issue, how do we take a specific approach to address this issue? And in, in addressing the issue of rising rates of maternal death, and we know for every maternal death, there's many more um, instances of, of near death or um, near miss experiences or severe maternal morbidity. And how do we begin to bring those rates down as well? Let's go to the next slide. So I want to pause on this slide just to show what you see to your left is our current system. That that's the house that this resembles. This is based uh, is an ode to a book written by the author Isabel Wilkerson called Cast. There's a, a movie out about Cast, actually um, directed by Ava DuVernay. It's called Origin. Uh, we're in an urgent need to transform, optimize, and improve our maternal health system uh, for everyone and, and make sure that we also, in doing so, can look at all populations, not just the population of those giving birth, but every population based on characteristics and demographics and begin to make sure that outcomes are great for everyone. Now, our current system, we weren't here. This house was built decades ago. It requires continuous work. And because none of us were here when it was built, as clinical providers or, or the healthcare workforce, we are heir to whatever is right or wrong with it. And to offer protection from the consequences of inaction, because we can no longer stand in the inertia of inaction to recognize that there are issues, rising rates of maternal morbidity and mortality, we have to think about in our own transformative spaces, whether we're administrative, clinical, in education, whether we're investigators or those who are leads of continuous quality improvement, we have to take action in our transformative spaces because in each of those spaces, there are specific work to be done. And when we do that, we'll be able to achieve optimal systems of care. Through perinatal quality collaboratives, I wanna give you some examples of ways that we found that this has been able to be effective. We'll go to the next slide. So this is just a, a wrap, a recap to say, we know that the rates are rising. We know that there are rates that are disproportionately affecting those who are black and native in this country as the largest demographic difference and the largest inequity among many other types of inequities. We know the CDC reports that 84% of deaths are preventable. And we also know and have data, um, many, many publications by Dr. Howell and others that improving system quality can improve outcomes and reduce disparities. And so as we wanna go to the next slide, we wanna think about moving toward 
inclusive excellence in maternal care. And this is, and I, and I say the words inclusive excellence because I'm just gonna throw out for many of you may have heard or even think when we hear the word equity, that we're saying that we're doing something for someone, that we're taking away from another individual, that we're not considering the whole. Equity is about being excellent and inclusive and then our excellence, making sure that our excellence touches everyone. And so as we move towards inclusive excellence, we can see improvements and outcomes. So we'll go to the next slide. And I'll, I'll say once again, I like to give my the trophy to the statement, which is maternal equity is inclusive excellence in obstetrical care because maternal equity is foundational and fundamental to quality. If we go to the next slide, um, we talk about this in terms of what we're thinking about for all the different populations, particularly racial equity, and we hear the words racism and it feels uncomfortable. But in the end, what we recognize, and what I love is that ACOG recognized that this is a public health issue and a women's health crisis. And they've published conversations and, and um, um, announcements in solidarity to say, we recognize that the issues related to race racism affect health outcomes. And so we have to think about what our systems look like and dismantle some of those systems in order to really achieve the outcomes we're looking for. And in doing so, what we're also doing is improving the system for everyone. We'll go to the next slide. This national conversation also continues on with AWAN, right? AWAN has said similar things and looks at birth equity and also has other um, initiatives to address respectful care uh, and addressing making sure that mothers, babies, and families and fathers are a part of making sure that we survive and thrive as communities through the birth experience. We'll go to the next slide. And I actually also love this um, caption from A1 that shows when hopes and dreams clash with racism in healthcare, right? We start to see these numbers uh, go in directions that we know we can um, improve upon. <clears throat> All right, let's go to the next slide. I'm still giving you some foundational information, but we're gonna to get to the meat of it and some really exciting st um, statistics in just a moment. I just wanna point out one more thing, which was, this is also uh, not just a national conversation. It's also not a new conversation. We know that the Institute of Medicine at the time when it was called the Institute of Medicine in 2001, when they reported this, which is now called the National Academies of Science, Medicine and Engineering, named equity, as an essential domain of quality. Quali quality healthcare should be safe, efficient, effective, timely, patient-centered, and equitable. And so we know that it's foundational. So oftentimes when we see the, um, if you go to the next slide, when we see the, the jargon, what I call su um, superfluous jargon of saying often, you know, high quality and using these adjectives to add into quality. If we go to the next slide, it's not so much about the adjectives. It's just simply, there is no range of quality. There is just simply excellent care that is available to and for everyone, or there is no quality. Because quality is safe, effective, efficient, um, et cetera. And so we wanna make sure that as we're laying these foundations for our healthcare system and championing these efforts for our communities, we recognize that there is no quality without equity. And that for us to have quality healthcare, we need to meet a certain number of goals. All right, let's go to the next slide. So let's jump into what those equity focused actions are, particularly within the quality improvement space. Go to the next slide, please. And I will start with talking about what the national focus has been for perinatal quality collaborative. So this is just a slide that shows um, the different states that have PQCs. And so there are PQCs in, in either active or in development in 50 states. Um, and the District of Columbia, and there's an increasing number of opportunities to address maternal equity throughout these PQCs. And I am just thrilled that in 2022, the CDC funded 26 state PQCs to address perinatal equity. So there's been a national movement and a focus to really begin to not only identify disparities, understand which disparities are inequities, but also begin to address what we can do to change those rates. We go to the next slide. How do PQCs function? So many of you know that PQCs are state-based networks of clinical and public health professionals that team together, work as stakeholders together to improve pregnancy and infant outcomes. And PQCs do strive to achieve population level impact through advancing evidence-based practices 
um, employing QI methods, ensuring partnerships um, with, with neonatal providers, obstetric providers, but birthing people and their families, nurses, nursing leadership, which is key and most important because the nursing leadership is really what moves QI work forward in hospital systems. Um, with that being said, it's important to know that the work that's being done is the implementation of often patient safety bundles. And so these patient safety bundles that are uh, developed, housed, and shared in the AIM program are uh, targeting the leading causes of death, which include cardiovascular disease, sepsis, hemorrhage. So as many of you have seen, the bundles address those issues. We go to the next slide. I like to think about, uh, and I really appreciate Dr. Bingham for creating this particular graphic, um, because we know we've seen many graphics like this. Uh, but with this particular graphic, what I enjoy is that there are women there and they're pregnant or they're birthing individually. I use the word women, understanding that everyone who can become pregnant doesn't identify as a woman, but it is my um, particular vernacular. That the equality is equivalent to implementing bundles. Like it's doing the same thing for everyone when we're, we're putting in place some of these uh, tactics. But when we think about what we're doing, we can also address equity. So equality is giving everyone, for instance, a discharge summary when they leave the hospital after their birth. Equity is giving everyone a discharge summary in their language so they can read it and understand what the message and the communication is. So the goal is that we can do for everyone. But what I think is beautiful about this and what I always like to show, and, and many of you may have seen if you've been to many of Dr. Bingham's um, PQI webinars, is the picture on the left with the boxes stacked that as we do this work, this is not taking a box from the person that's orange or pink to give to the person that's purple. We have additional boxes. This is not a zero sum game. I think that's one of the important things to know and something always important to pass on to leadership as we're trying to get support for these types of, of um, activities. All right, so go to the next slide and then we're gonna entree into the article. Um, oh goodness, well, one more click, Kaylee, maybe there it is. So we wrote an article, um, a narrative review of strategies to promote maternal health equity, the role of PQI, PQCs. And what we did, we searched about a decade of published literature from around January, 2013 to April, 2023, because as many of you know, the rise of PQCs have really been mostly in the last decade. We did look at all of the um, search engines, Medline, PubMed, Sendall, um, of the databases. And we found just under hundred articles that address perinatal quality improvement and equity. But among those, only about 26 really contributed to the current understanding of QI projects in hospitals, health systems, and public health departments, um, and our state PQCs to promote maternal equity, with some of them proposing maternal health equity framework, six of them proposed tools and strategies to address maternal health equity through leadership. Um, and in the end, we were able to, to compile what we found were our um, six main uh, strategies that we'll talk about individually, and that is really leveraging leadership, leveraging data, engaging partners, engaging community as a really key partner, educating clinicians, and then collaboration as a way to implement practice change. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And this is the one that I'm excited really to share, which is the slide that shows that PQI, perinatal QI, is working. Perinatal QI is working because we have three studies that have been published that demonstrate reductions in diagnosis-specific maternal morbidity and racial disparities resulting from their implementation efforts. So the first you see is Dr. Main uh, and his team at the California Perinatal Quality Collaborative. They published this in 2020. And across 99 birth facilities in California, they uh, implemented the, uh, hemorrhage, the hemorrhage bundle, the obstetric hemorrhage bundle uh, across these hospitals and what they were able to report was a decrease in SMM-related hemorrhage across racial groups. And that the whether, where they started with their gap between Black-white SMM rates actually reduced to non-statistically significant. And after, of course, adjusting for sociodemographic and other clinical factors, they were able to show a closure in the gap. Really important. Another publication that came out in 2022 was Dr. Christina Davidson and her team in Texas. So Texas PQC was implementing the AIM Obstetric Hemorrhage Bundle. They also did some work to um, do some bias education and case reviews. And what they were able to do was also decrease SMM for all groups related to hemorrhage and also see a closure of their black-white gap. And in another study, 
uh, Dr. Ham and her team, Dr. Um, Stravinas and all at uh, New Penn reported significant reductions in maternal morbidity for their Black patients after implementing a QI project as well. And they specifically targeted racial inequities in obstetric hemorrhage. So just want to pause on that and give everyone a moment to look and see perinatal QI has shown benefits and has working and it's associated. Right now we can't cause state causation, of course, right, with, with the implementation. But what we're seeing is that as these teams are implementing, we're seeing improvements. Now, how we structure this particular um, table for, for everyone was to also show the QI strategies employed. So I'll show you those one through six. And we also uh, use uh, a particular key that uh, was also created by Dr. Bingham to be able to explain how it is that we think that these um, tactics and strategies are employed, or I'm sorry, how it is that these particular strategies are employed and becoming effective. And so we'll say a little bit more about that. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll start with the first one. The first one is leadership. We learned from the publications and from the discussions, and we've also seen from experience in some of our own PQCs and in the PQC that I co-lead as one of the um, directors of the PQC, I'm not the only, um, <clears throat> is that leadership-based equity-focused strategies are effective in increasing accountability, buy-in, collaboration. And so if we can communicate maternal equity as a priority, we saw that that was one of the first and number one strategic priorities in order to really start to make this needle move. And in doing that, we also invest resources to develop all that we need, those data systems so that we can look at the outcomes by different demographics and capture and report inequities. And it also helps us to establish um, a culture of equity. We'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> and so what is a culture of equity? A culture of equity is a system that values and actively works towards ensuring that everyone receives the care and support necessary to achieve optimal health outcomes. And I would actually argue, and if you wanna use reactions again, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm having a hard time with my throat today, but if you wanna put your thumbs up again, how many of you feel like this is already your goal in your health system or on your labor and delivery unit? Yeah. Exactly. We're all working to achieve a culture of equity. And in order to do so, and in order to uh, ensure that we have the ability to reach this goal, we have to have accountability. We have to have measurement. We have to have ways to be able to see if that's happening. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> I'll show an example. In Massachusetts, we have implemented a maternal equity bundle where we've had 22 hospitals engage approximately as many as 17, as few as 11 hospitals report data every month through the 12 months that we had um, initially implemented the bundle and this bundle is still continuing on through till June. And I wanted to share and show that what we asked for is for people to essentially establish governance. That in order to promote maternal equity through leadership, we needed to have a committee. We needed to have people talking about it. And not just a committee in your hospital, because how many of us see that when you have a committee in your hospital and you're looking at particular outcomes, our birth outcomes might be overshadowed by something related to diabetes screening or other cardiovascular conditions. So we needed our own internal systems and our own internal teams on our L&D units to think about what it is that's happening because not every hospital system shows a racial inequity. That hospital may show a geographic inequity. That hospital may show an inequity related to language. So we need to be able to look at our own information, our own data to determine what was important for our own institutions and units because it may not be that what you see in the national data is pertinent to your unit, you need to look at your own data. And as we look at our own data, who is looking at that data and then deciding what needs to happen in order to improve outcomes for different groups. So what was beautiful about this experience and, and the goal of these slides that you're gonna look at that are orange and blue is to see all blue. All blue means we've hit goal. When you see orange, it means we're still working towards goal. And so as you can see from left to right, from September to October, we were actually able to get all of our teams to say they formed an equity committee within their unit to begin thinking about these issues, which is really key and, and a strong step forward. We'll go to the next slide. 
I actually uh, was formerly at Brigham and Women's Hospital um, as I began this work with the Perinatal Neonatal Quality Improvement Network of Massachusetts, which is our PQC. Um, but now I'm here at the University of California in San Diego. And wonderfully, we also have an equity committee. Ours is called the Culture and Justice Quorum. Uh, and we actually published on this in Academic Medicine and talk about how our department is taking a specific approach to dismantling structural racism to think about how we can improve not only outcomes for patients, but also experiences and outcomes for faculty and staff as well. We'll go to the next slide. Where we also see opportunity is in goal setting. So again, these slides in order to say that we've reached goal need to be all blue. So we see a lot of orange here. And all of these variations of orange and, and shades of light blue tell us that we're still not quite there in the goal of goal setting. So one of the first QI steps is to create a SMART goal, to create an aim, develop an aim statement, a driver diagram, fishbone diagrams, et cetera. And in doing that, we're able to think about what steps we're taking, which direction we're going. It's sort of our guiding light. Um, but many of our teams hadn't established those goals yet which just shows that there's opportunity to continue to move forward if we're really gonna achieve maternal equity. All right, so let's go to the next slide in the second <clears throat> lesson learned, which is that of stratifying data to promote equity. It's really important to leverage our data and enhance our surveillance because if we stratify by demographics, and so these um, mnemonics are spelled out in the paper, but real or race, ethnicity, language, SOGI or social or um, sexual orientation and gender identity, SDOH is the social determinants of health and geography. If we're stratifying data by those demographics, we're going to start to understand where are their disparities, what's the root cause of them, what's the magnitude of them, whether those disparities are actually inequities. Um, if we get that information by self-report, that's most accurate. It really gives us the information we need to move forward rather than assigning race, language to other people based on how they look or how they sound. Um, if we can create dashboards, and then with these dashboards, utilize information from our MMRCs to inform our QI projects and our work. Those are our maternal mortality review committees on maternal deaths. And also use standardized screening tools um, that can tell us a bit more about what it is that we're finding and understanding about some of the risks that patients are experiencing. Also included in those dashboards that could be really helpful is to implement PREM or patient report experience measures. So actually not just having the qualitative, I'm sorry, the quantitative data of the C-section rate or the percentage of time that we treated hypertension within one hour. We also want that alongside patient experience. And then I'd actually argue and add, we want to then start adding in our own um, staff experience to make sure that we're all enjoying our experience of delivering high quality care. And again, I don't want to use the word high quality care. In 2011, the California Perinatal Quality Collaborative established a real-time data system and stratified by race, ethnicity, and language using birth certificate data, hospital discharge files, and performance, performance measures. And so to do that, they then have been able to flourish into the CMQCC data center, which is um, beautifully able to support many hospital teams in moving forward to achieve their goals. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Here's an example of what we're doing in Massachusetts with our um, equity bundle. If you can see again, the goal is that there's blue all the way and we see blue mostly to the right, which says we do a great job of, stra of collecting data that is self-reported that it tells who someone's race, ethnicity and language are. If you go to the next slide, <clears throat> we don't do as great of a job yet with stratifying, but we're working toward it. We're seeing that in that first um, top box, the blue, the dark blue is increasing over time. And then in the second box under ethnicity, the blue is increasing over time. So we're working on it and we're growing in the right direction that shows those opportunities that we're looking for. If we go to the next slide. The third lesson learned is that of engaging and collaborating with partners. Partnerships are central to perinatal quality collaborative initiatives. We know, for example, um, the CMQCC and um, the Penquin Pen and many other PQCs work with the March of Dimes to disseminate our toolkits. We also partner and support each other with partnerships across PQCs through the NMPQC. It just helps us build capacity. If we go to the next slide, I just wanna pause and just um, show that we have a, a box in our paper that shows these first three, communicating um, equity as a priority, leveraging data and engaging with our partners. If you go to the next slide, I wanna show how we're saying that the, these six strategies um, can be characterized to define 
why they are um, significant or relevant. Meaning some people may think, okay, so you communicated with partners. How does that really make sure that we're moving the needle? Well, there is something called the ERIC Expert Recommendations for Implementing Change. And then um, a future development of that became Dr. Bingham's ABCDEs of Implementation Strategies and Tactics. And these are based in those uh, ERIC expert recommendations. And so what has been happening is over the years, many experts have gotten together in, in the QI world to say and show that there are specific strategies and tactics that lead to actual change, not just we're, we're putting something in place, but we're actually seeing an improvement with that. And so in order to really underscore how these strategies, these six strategies that we're talking about have been able to bring significance and relevance, we actually categorize them through the ABCDEs, accountability, buy-in, collaboration and communication, data, education and structure. So there's also a box in the publication that goes into many different tactics uh, because the strategies are those high level plans to accomplish the goals, whereas the tactic refers to the specific action taken to execute that plan and achieve the outcome. And so we have a specific list under, for instance, data to assess readiness and identify barriers to facilitators and complete audits and provide feedback. So we give specific tactics under the strategy of data. So let's go to the next slide. I wanna quickly go into the next three, which are collaborate with and listen to patients from the community. So number three was engage with strategic partners. Number four, is to really make sure that one of your strategic partners are patients and family and community and make sure that it's not just us um, talking to each other between hospital systems or public health system and hospital system without engaging in the community, really incorporating community feedback. It makes a, a more rich uh, discussion. And when we diversify who our stakeholders are at the table as we're moving forward our QI strategies, we really start to see that we can um, improve outcomes. If you go to the next slide, Four will just show us the collaborate with community. I'm gonna move more quickly because I wanna to get to some questions of those that may be in the in, among the audience. Number five on the next slide will be to educate clinicians. We also wanna make sure that we provide clinical updates, which we do um, often through QI and train uh, our, our teams on QI tools and strategies. Uh, we can also in our own departments uh, for nursing grand rounds, for MD grand rounds, for hospital or department grand rounds, offer health equity rounds to make sure that we're really underscoring what are those challenges that we're facing. Um, particularly, March of Dimes put out a really nice recent report on the challenges to access for rural communities. And so it's a large health equity issue with, with um, rural um, lack of access to maternal care. Uh, and then also providing education on the effect of racism and bias on maternal outcomes. If you go to the next slide, we did a lot of this in Massachusetts by bringing Dr. Bingham's speak up um, work to Massachusetts and to our bundle pre prior to launching our bundle to really start those conversations. Dr. Bingham opened with the, the statement that it is conversation that is the beginning of change. So having these conversations of what are those root causes of inequities, how we found ourselves here in the United States, why is it that we can see outcomes worse here than we see in other countries and start to really think about ways we can challenge that and reconstruct the way we do business so that we can improve outcomes. What we saw here in Massachusetts over the course of September to October was that we really were able to train a large percentage of our faculty and staff. Uh, we were able to maintain those percentages above 60%. Uh, and then we've also seen over time those rates and percentages increase to 70 to 80 and sometimes up to 92% of clinicians educated um, on issues related to bias and health inequities. All right, let's go to the next slide. And then the sixth of our six is to collaborate to implement best practices. So implementation of maternal safety bundles is a pretty you know, prescriptive checklist of protocols and processes and trainings, algorithms to minimize variation in practice. So essentially these are what we're doing with the AIM patient safety bundles that target those leading causes of maternal morbidity and mortality. The goal of all of this is to drive rapid cycle change and improvement, not to talk about that we need change, not to sit in inertia looking at these data's past bias on screens, but truly engage in collaborative learning, implement safety bundles that, we are, that are shown to be working, study them to understand what parts of it work, what parts of it don't really necessarily need to be done, um, and standardize uh, protocols and policies and algorithms and share that broadly and shamelessly. 
I'm going to go to the next slide, just doing pictures and examples of what it is to implement a smarty aim, to um, put in place a driver diagram, to put in place a fishbone diagram, um, to do PDSA cycles and to map it. So there's lots of different QI steps that we can take. And wonderfully, it's been great to see, if you go to the next slide, our key takeaways, um, go up one more slide, Kaylee, which is that maternal morbidity and mortality are increasing in the US that um, there are ongoing inequities by not only race and ethnicity, which is really important because it's the largest gap, but also by geography and by payer status. Those who are funded and, and their births are paid for by Medicaid also have higher rates of, of poor outcomes. We know that the U.S.'s poor performance as a health system is a systems problem, not a problem of the individuals. And it's going to take systems level strategies to improve this problem of our health inequities. In these six areas, we've been able to not only see in the literature, but also show you three key states that have been able to show um, a closure and a reduction in their gaps by employing these very specific strategies, which is having a leadership commitment to equity, stratifying data to understand where your disparities are and where your inequities exist and surveil that and have some accountability and monitoring for forward progress of your interventions. Engaging your strategic partners with one of them, and more importantly, being patients and communities. Bring patients and community to your equity um, committees and bring them to the table at your PQCs um, to make sure that we're really achieving the goals that are important for everyone. Addressing bias um, through education and collaborating to promote equitable care for everyone. And so in doing all of those, we can really work to establish a culture of equity and ensure that quality standards not even high quality, just quality, meeting the goals of quality of what is safe, effective, efficient, timely, patient-centered, that that is met for all populations. Um, and with that, I want to close, say thank you to the authors and thank you for listening and start to dive into questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Meadows. Thank you so much for this very informative presentation. Uh, I see a few questions have come in already. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other better. Okay. And um, and just, uh, I think that will work out well. So the first question, well, I should say the last one that came in, the first one we'll address is how much of the difference between the US and Europe is related to dominance of obstetric in the US where midwifery is suppressed? Uh, yeah. That's a hard one. What do you think as an obstetrician? Yeah, that's a tough question in terms of actually being able to give a numeric answer for what percentage of it. But the um, a really great place to find a lot of the information related to the international comparisons is the Commonwealth Fund. Dr. Lori Zephyrin, who's also an obstetrician and gynecologist, but who's their vice president for health equity, has a web page on the Commonwealth Fund website that is just rich with lots of information and lots of publications. And there's one particular publication where she and other co-authors write about a 10 country comparison. So there's a lot more information there to talk about why they see some of the differences. Um, it's not actually giving a numeric percentage to the fact that we have a difference in workforce, but they really key in on the fact that there's a difference in workforce, that the workforce being midwifery and having a midwifery focus in, in other countries. In addition to that, though, it, there's, it's worth stating, and I think you'd agree with this, Deborah, so you know, add if you think differently. When you have a country that leads with a public health foundation for healthcare you're going to have a greater midwifery workforce. Our workforce in the United States and our healthcare system in the United States is, is, is oft rooted in um, um, economics. And so because of that, we see a workforce that looks very different than the countries that have their health system rooted in public health. And I'll add to that, I think it's also a mindset of physiologic birth versus uh, birth as um, risky and dangerous where 80% of births, um, at least uh, healthy women um, are coming in to have a baby and end up with a third of them with a C-section. I mean, you know, it's, there's a lot to be said for the model of care, but I love your point about uh, the, even going even a, a level higher where it being um, people's perspective around public health focused approach. Uh, yeah. There's a question here, and I see some hands, and we'll definitely get to those. Um, one is about uh, examples of PQCs are engaging patients and community members, which I think yeah. is really critical. Do you have some thoughts around that? 
I absolutely do. Colorado PQC, I think, is doing a phenomenal job with this. And so we actually had met with Colorado's PQC, um, the PINQUIN, our state perineal quality collaborative in Massachusetts, and really discussed what their infrastructure was and how they did it. And we sought funding. And we have now, and, I'll, I, and, and Kaylee can actually speak to this because she's the, um, um, the manager for our PQC, uh, is that we actually hired a new person to lead our work to engage community members. And something that was really important is we would say to teens, you know, make sure you engage community. But we didn't have a path for them to do that. Uh, and then when you do engage something for someone from community, this person might be alone and basically have no sort of community themselves around how to feel like their voice can be heard because it can be uncomfortable and intimidating sometimes to sit in spaces where that's not your... Um, the, the folks that you typically work with, right? They're, they're not the people that you would typically sit in meetings with. And so in order to feel a sense of community and feel a sense of empowerment, to feel connected to the conversations, what we've done is establish or we're establishing in Massachusetts and what Colorado's established and others probably have as well, but these are the, the two that I can speak to, is a coalition. So that way you can bring in folks who want to bring their voice to PQC work. They have a sense of community with each other through the PQC, and then they can go out to the different hospitals, those hospitals that they actually either may have delivered at or have communications, have had, um, sorry, relationships with, or may um, just wanna go and represent a community that that hospital serves. But in that regard, we can offer training and work together um, and, and really pushing forward our initiatives and just establishing our goals. So that way it isn't so much around, you make sure we find a community member and, and just bring this person on. And it's very performative to do that when we haven't figured out a way to make sure that that person feels like they're really part of the system of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish together. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I want to elevate the work by Mama's Voices, which also yeah. is helping uh, prepare people who've had um, more, you know, severe morbidity or some kind of traumatic birth experience, so that they're prepared to be a part of those conversations in a way doesn't that doesn't further traumatize them and gives them additional support for uh, uh, in in many ways. So I would also reach out to Mama's Voices as a way to help you identify people who have uh, have that support from that really very powerful organization support, uh, really amazing work that they're doing there. Um, yeah, but don't be discouraged uh, uh, about reaching out to the community. Anna, I see your hands up and you've been on camera. So let's go to you. What's your question? Um, you're on mute. Is that better? Yes. I always forget. <laughs> um, I'm a doula in Arkansas, and I have um, spent some time with a Black community uh, network of doulas, and um, just where do we need to start to make this more, you know, um, I'm sorry, I've been talking to a mom and trying to do this and I got to go to the doctor. Where should we start to get the ball rolling in our state or to or who should we contact? Because Google gives entirely too many answers. <laughs> OK, I'm done. <laughs> it sure I'm does. sorry. Um, and I'd I mean, argue you've already started. You're a doula. You're doing the work. I think that that's the first start. And I want to congratulate you for that and say thank you that this is it is so beautiful, I think, in, in, in my lifetime to be able to see we've had all these challenges with maternal health. We've seen how over the years, the historical uh, changes to workforce, to um, delivery of infants and, and care for moms and women. And now to see doulas coming back into the spaces and really growing and seeing the policies and legislation to, to pay doulas, because as women, we shouldn't have to do free work to support each other. It's great that you know we now are having legislation that's paying people for the work to support moms and babies. I would say you know places to go is definitely your Arkansas PQC and see who's doing work there and what collaborations that they may want to have. I'm not sure if Arkansas has a doula organization or what state might have an organization because so doulas range um, so broadly and the, the care that they deliver and the types of ways that they give care. Um, so there may not be one specific organization, but having community with, with each other is, I think, really key to making sure that people hear your voices, know where you are, 
support, um, you know, coming into hospital systems and support going into birth centers and support going to each other's homes uh, in ways that are safe and effective and can bring back really great stories to everyone to keep elevating the, the, the work of doulas. Um, so I think I'd, I'd offer, and Deborah, please add in, you know, definitely going to your PQC, definitely seeing among payers like Medicaid in Arkansas, if they're starting to pay for doula services and what that looks like, because they may also want to have um, conversations and community with doula groups to make sure that they can um, advertise that you're out there um, for moms who would need those support. Yeah, and I would just say, who are you talking to? Expand who you talk to and who you're connecting with and um, joining organizations um, are just underscoring some of the same strategies that uh, Audra outlined. So, and if it isn't, hasn't been formed, you can form your, <laughs> you can get other doulas together to yeah. share insights. You have insights to share. Uh, when I was a director of nursing, I was shocked how rarely people reached out to me in, in New York City, nonetheless, to uh, make sure that, um, you know, to be in touch with the director of nursing for maternal child health. So feel free to reach out to hospital administrators as well. We have several other questions, uh, but I yes, just, Deborah, yeah, we're at the hour. Yeah, go ahead, Audrey. I don't want to interrupt, but I do want to make one comment to Sharonda Boston's question about studies on recently immigrated women in the U.S. and birth outcomes. You know, I want to say studies are, are, are small and low, and I think it's a really important question because we are seeing lots of immigration. I am a border town here in San Diego, seeing lots of folks come into the United States as refugees from war, um, and issues related to climate disasters. So the number of immigrant women coming to the United States to give birth is just increasing as well. And what we mostly have in literature are foundational studies that show a healthy immigrant effect, but we know that that's not true. We know that rates of SMM are high there too, because there's inequities related to language rather related to cultural experiences. And it's something that there needs to be more data on. But I wanna say that the literature is thin. It's mostly in Canada and there's some in Europe, but I haven't seen any great studies in the US at all that talk about those outcomes related to um, immigrants coming into the United States, particularly uh, recent immigrants as refugees, and just how they are also someone who is a vulnerable population um, for having a poor birth outcome without the right resource. So I just really wanted to shout out to that because it's a really great question and, and the information is just not out there. And back to your point about structures, if the structure is bad for it, if the structure needs to be good for everybody, it needs to be high quality, it needs to be quality for everyone. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, we're happy to follow up an email if that would be desirable for you. Um, but thank you, Dr. Meadows, for your time. And thank you all of you who joined us today. And we wish you um, a very wonderful rest of your day. And thank you for all the work you're doing. So we'll see you around. Thank you, everybody. It's so good to see your beautiful faces. Have a lovely day.